Blog Talk Radio. We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about, and the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good afternoon and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we have another fantastic show today. We have a very special guest coming with us from the east or excuse me, from the west coast of California today, Dick Gould. And I'm going to give you a little information on Dick. Before I do that, however, a couple of uh, bookkeeping announcements. First of all, we are moving the show to Tuesdays starting next week. I have found with my son's tournament schedule, it's just gotten too challenging to try and get these Mondays done on time. And rather than having to pre-record all the shows and air them on Mondays, I'd rather be able to do them live on Tuesdays. So uh, the time is still up in the air. Please watch our Facebook page or Twitter feed for updates on that. Right now, it's looking like Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time will be our airtime, but I will confirm that later in the week. Also, wanted to just remind you guys that the show does air live for an hour and then goes into podcast recordings. So if we go past the one-hour mark today, you can always listen to the podcast on the radio show page at ParentingAces.com. And that podcast will be online later this afternoon for you. And I am always looking for guests for the show and ideas for guests. So if you or someone you know is interested in coming on the show as my guest, or if you have a suggestion for someone you'd like to hear from, please shoot me an email to lisa at parentingaces.com and I will reach out and get you on the calendar, Um, especially as the holidays approach. It gets a little bit tricky trying to get these guests scheduled. Everybody's so busy, and there's so many tournaments coming up. So I want to make sure that I have quality information to share with you all. And like I said, if you have ideas of people or topics you'd like me to address, I'm more than happy to entertain those suggestions and try to make that happen. So that said, there are currently two other really fabulous shows on the UR Tennis Network, and those both air on Wednesdays. One is hosted by Jason Haynes, who runs the network, and the other is hosted by Chuck Creasy, who is the head men's coach at the Citadel. And uh, both of those gentlemen provide incredible information on tennis, on the industry, on college tennis, junior tennis, development, all sorts of things. So I want to encourage you to check those out. You can hear the podcast at urtennisnetwork.com slash blog, excuse me, blogtalkradio.com slash urtennisnetwork. And you can find all of the archive shows there. All right. So Today's guest, let me get to that, and man, it is a Monday around here. My head is in a thousand places, but let me tell you a little bit about Dick Gould, who is my guest today and who I am so excited to to talk with on the air because this man has, has been involved in tennis for so many years and has seen so many changes that he'll be able to provide us with some perspective on what's going on currently in the industry, but also what he's seen change for the good and maybe for the not so good over the years. So here's his deal. Dick Gould is currently the John L. Hines Director of Tennis at Stanford University. He actually got his master's in education and his undergraduate degree both from Stanford and has been the Stanford men's tennis coach 
for 38 years. He was there from 1966 to 2004. So I am telling you this man knows the history of college tennis and will be able to share so much with us. His team saw 17 NCAA team championships with him at the helm, 10 NCAA singles championships, seven NCAA doubles championship teams. And he personally coached, as their college coach, nine players who reached the top 15 in the ATP World Singles Rankings, 14 players who reached the top 10 in the ATP World Doubles Rankings, and seven attained a number one World Doubles Ranking. 11 have won Grand Slam Doubles Championships. So I, I'm telling you, Dick Gould is the master. He has so much information to share with us, and I'm really, really excited to pick his brain a bit on the air today. Before I bring Dick on the line, though, just a quick commercial, and when we come back, Stanford's own Dick Gould. Warning. Orthopedic surgeons are seeing an increase in overuse injuries when young athletes perform the same repetitive, repetitive, repetitive stressful motions over and over. over. Pitching, tennis, weight training, even long swimming workouts can cause overuse trauma that may require surgery. If your kids play and train hard, visit orthoinfo.org or stopsportsinjuries.org. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's You Are Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and I am so excited to share with you today the wonderful Dick Gould. Coach, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being with us. Lisa, it's an honor. It's uh, still early morning out here in California. we got to catch up with you guys back there. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to to get you up early today, but I'm so grateful to you for <laughs> taking time out to be with us because I I just I know what you know I know a little bit of what you know, um, and am thrilled to pick your brain and have you share that knowledge with my audience too. So thank you, thank you. My pleasure. So you've been at Stanford pretty much your entire coaching career. Is that correct? Well, I I, I got my master's at Stanford in. 1960 and spent two years uh, as a full-time high school teacher and coach football and uh, and tennis and then four years at a new community college foothill college uh and then when my coach retired at stanford in the fall of in the spring of 66 i took over in the fall of 66 so i've been here as coach for 38 years and then another 11 now in my 11th year of director of tennis and what does that mean, director of tennis? What what does that job entail for you? It's it's interesting. It's a continuation of things I was doing as I was coaching, but as the coaching demands became more and more uh, relegated to a lot of paperwork and desk work, which is the biggest surprise of everyone enter, entering the profession, uh, I found myself in a in a niche where I could really help the coaches by by providing some of the stewardship, uh, the facility, uh, not just maintenance and upkeep and repair, and, and but facility fundraising, uh, uh, rentals, and, and things like that, plus uh, the community relations up, uh, thing, which a lot of times the coaches don't have, have time for. So it's been a great, uh, great time for me. It's still 50, 60 hours a week, and I'm loving it, and uh, hopefully I'm adding some, some value to, to the position. What amazed me when I was reading your resume was the fact that in your – tenure, during your tenure, you've managed to get the tennis program at Stanford fully endowed. Can you talk a little bit about what that took and what that means for the school and for the tennis program? Uh, you know, this just happened, Lisa. It just finally just culminated. It's something we've been working on for years. Uh, you know, tennis is one of those sports that, that is, is really a threatened species in many schools, and, and about 400 school, schools have dropped tennis in the last 30 years. Uh, I think with the new power conference that is looks like it's to be formed soon with the five, five of the major conferences, uh, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the athletic departments to decide whether or not they're going to keep sports like uh, men's gymnastics, uh, men's volleyball, uh, men's water polo, uh, tennis, uh, men's and women's, you know, it's going to be tough. So a long time ago, I decided, you know, if I'm going to protect my sport and be sure we're here forever, I better start fundraising to see if we can make it so that it can never be taken away because of financial reasons. 
So over a period of time, we we started raising money. First of all, for scholarships for for Stanford, as an example, that's about sixty two thousand a year, uh, and for men, it's four and a half scholarships. Uh, an endowment that provi- provides enough income to pay for that for one of those is uh, over a million dollars, well over a million dollars. So that was the first thing, naming scholarships. That was a university-wide effort, uh, athletic department-wide effort, but we were very successful in, in men's tennis. I think we were the first sport to have our team fully endowed in terms of scholarships. In fact, we had a surplus, which now kicks over to cover our operating expenses uh, and our operating budget. And and in the meantime, we uh, raised some funds and split some funds to provide for about $2 million for a facility and maintenance environment uh, endowment as well. Uh, my position was endowed as director of tennis, but our head coach and assistant coach positions were not. And, and uh, unfortunately, a Churchill Manger Trust became uh, matured. The, the, the couple both passed on, but that was designated to endow the assistant position. That's a little over a million bucks. And then uh, our head coaching position is three million. That just got endowed about uh, about a month ago. So that completed our endowment at about $20 million. And, and we can continue to add, of course, to the maintenance repair endowment. But I think it really is the maybe maybe uh, the only program in all of the sport in the United States that is completely and truly endowed. That's amazing. I mean, that's, you know, it it, it gives a safety net to the program. And I, I just think it's a phenomenal effort that that you had it up there. And congratulations to you. We're very proud of that, and I think you know now we're, we're working. The women's uh, eight scholarships are endowed, but their operating budget is not. Their positions were partially endowed, the coaching position, but they are not fully. And so, uh, there's a lot of work to be done still. But but I think uh, we all as coaches must uh, must work hard to do this. Uh, if not, we're we're kidding ourselves. It will be around forever. So so it was kind of a, <laughs> a fight or flight reaction type thing. It's something we had to do, and I, I am very proud that it got done. And uh, uh, hopefully it will keep our program strong. Well, and what would be great is if other programs could look to Stanford as a model for how to make this happen in their schools and, you know, really preserve the sport in all the schools. I mean, without... I, without I think... Yeah, Lisa, I think you're right. I think that it's uh, it's something that has to be done, uh, but it, it's not something you do overnight. I mean, that's that's twenty million dollars, a lot of money. Ten uh, percent of that is uh, two million, but you only can earn. Uh, maybe that's what the fund earns, but then you can only spend half of that. The rest of it goes back into principal to keep the endowment growing, so it covers the uh, inflation, the cost of living increases, and so on. So, so uh, it is important, and I. I I, I think that we all have to we all have to work hard on that, but realizing it can't be done overnight. This is you know I've been lucky enough been here a long time and and create a lot of relationships that uh, in the area that have helped us a lot be able to be able to do this. Sure, sure. Well, one of the things that Stanford has been doing really well recently is providing live streaming of matches, and I know that's something that you've worked on and you're excited about. Can you talk a little bit about how the live streaming, like what the process was behind getting that in place and how that's changing things for tennis at the university? Well, first of all, I think it's unrealistic to expect a TV crew to come in with six cameras for six matches, a uh, six cameraman, a truck, a uh, production truck, uh, gen- a spare generator, and uh Announcers, uh, maybe a forty thousand dollar cost for any match that's that's televised, and then of course you have the weather weather impact. What if it rains and and it's not broadcast after all? So uh, we felt right up front that that was going to be an unrealistic expectation for tennis, and so as streaming became a more viable thing, uh, we hosted the NCAA championship for men and women, the first one for both sports uh, combined at one site in 2006. And a big fundraising goal of that tournament was to provide enough money to set up a streaming system on our 12 competition courts. Actually, we did 17 of them. Uh, and, And that has evolved and been perfected as we've gone along. We've just completed a HD upgrade for our six competition courts, and if you turn on uh, 
Actually, the easiest way is going into www.streamingtennis.com. Uh, you get a great picture of the of the six courts and and what it looks like, and it really is a tremendous thing. Uh, the umpire in the chair changes the score uh, for the scoreboard in the stadium, Dactronic scoreboard, and that score appears superimposed on the screen you're watching. You can blow it up to full screen. You can change to whatever court you want to watch. And we now, with this HD upgrade, actually broadcast our matches. Uh, so far, I'm by default the broadcaster, but as we get into January, uh, it's nice because we can switch from court to court to court with a monitor I control for the viewer. You can stay in one court. You can stay with the broadcast starting with the number one court, but if when court four gets close, five ball in the second set, you switch to that court for a couple of games, and you go to court six, and you come back to court three, and so on. So it's it's a great thing, and it's television quality, and, and I'm just hoping that our different contracts for television and streaming with the different conferences don't exclude this or, or still allow us to do it because it would be a crime to invest all this and have this for free. Uh, I know we do stream through our Pac-12 network, but of course we want to be able to broadcast each match because we have parents all over the country and all over the world who want to watch their kids play and even practice. So that's yeah, a little bit of the history of it. And the quality is phenomenal. I mean, I I tuned in. It is now with HD cameras. It really is. What you see if you blow the, any one of the six courts up on your screen, it's beautiful on your computer. But you can also uh, Roku some of these things. You can attach it to your. 70-inch TV screen at home and get the same quality picture. It's 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 good and it's a direction direction really uh, that we're doing in the country, taking our country through regular uh, uh, network channels. Uh, H uh, ESPN3 I think is a streaming station now, uh, and there are of course with the different movies and everything else. It's it's becoming a really big business. I, I, I'm proud that we were one of the first ones to do this. Did did you guys um, involve students at the university in developing the streaming product or no uh, we we had uh, as we we had a streaming company that we went to and and uh, worked through that through them originally but as we got better and better and better what we're doing uh they led us to a guy who's a a guru at this actually he, he's done a lot of the spn labs uh studios uh some major pavilions and so on as an audio visual expert and and he's just incredible and so we've been working one on one with him over the years and and uh since 2005 frankly and uh the product is really good that's fantastic well so that kind of segues us into the next topic i'd like to tackle which is the evolution of college tennis and given that you've been involved for such a long time you've seen a lot of changes in the the whole system of college tennis in this country, because you were there pre-Title IX, you obviously are there post-Title IX, you've been through scoring changes and format changes and and postseason changes. Can you share with us what you see as the the changes that have really added to the game and the changes that maybe have interfered with the development of the game and where you see things heading in 2015 moving forward. <laughs> That's a lot of topics for one okay. for one answer. Which one should we start with? Well, let's let's start with with kind of a historical perspective. Maybe you can give us a, in a nutshell the major changes that you've seen in college tennis since you've been involved. Surely, I think uh, first of all. Uh, uh, there have always been foreigners involved in college tennis when I was playing uh, after World War II. Uh, there were quite a few foreigners at some of the smaller schools. Uh, but I would say the first thing that, that became apparent uh, probably mid-70s, uh, as the ITA got stronger and started publishing rankings, they used to publish where each player was from in the final rankings, and meaning country. And uh, in the mid-70s, if you look at the first Ten rank years of rankings or so, uh, where they listed where the players were from, uh, of the men's rankings, uh, two thirds, 66, give or take one or two each year, were performed from foreign countries. Uh, when I first started coaching, it wasn't that high. Although some schools were predominantly foreign, it wasn't wasn't commonplace overall. Uh, that that stay that figure stayed about the same uh, from the mid 70s on. Now the ITA just publishes a school that the uh, students attend not the country they're from. 
but still, if you break it down and do some research, it's about 66% for men. And the women were, were about 60% in this uh, early 80s. Uh, they're probably about two-thirds now as well. So that has been a change. Uh, realizing, of course, I'm not saying it's bad or good. There have been a lot of good good results of that because it's as more and more top players uh 20 years ago started going to the pros as pro tennis evolved and became more money uh, available, uh, more prize money, uh, and players were lured into that after a year or two of college or even without college. Uh, the top of the college tennis declined a little bit, the uh, ability level, but the base of tennis was picked up by the influx of the foreigners. And I think people who, who I never did offer a scholarship to a foreign player because we were able to get the top Americans, and I would take a top five American against a top five foreigner most any day, uh, at least as being an equal in terms of tennis ability. But uh, we we just saw this big change, and, and uh, we got better because we were competing against better teams that had more depth and more better teams. Instead of having two or three great teams in the country, all of a sudden you had ten teams that had a legitimate shot to win the national championship. And that made us better as well. And I think people tend to forget we were all foreign at one time. Our ancestors immigrated to the United States. And and these players don't have the same opportunity. They don't have a college sports system in the countries where they're from. So it's a tremendous opportunity for these players. And in a lot of ways has made college tennis stronger. That being said... Uh, that also has has really cut down the opportunities for the Americans and for scholarships, uh, especially in men's tennis where you only have four and a half scholarships, the equivalent of. So that's the first issue that I've seen, the thing I've seen change. I'm not saying it's bad or good. There, there are points both ways, but uh, that's been one change. Another change uh, is in the format of college tennis. Uh, from World War II on and before that, before World War II, you always played six singles, two out of three sets, and then you followed that with three doubles matches. And as we started to do more, as we went to the NCAA championships, uh, team championships in 77, it turned out that these matches went on and on and on. And in the last match of the year uh, in the NCAAs and say, the quarterfinals, if you win six singles, you're going to dump the doubles because that's the last match of the season. There's no reason, no, no reason to play it. And as we started having the National Team Indoor Championship, there's another match to go on, your short courts. So, again, the matches stopped as soon as they were clinched. The result was that doubles in those two national events became uh, weren't played unless they were necessary. Uh, uh, what started happening then in dual matches, if you went on a trip and you played, say, in Southern California against one school on a Friday and another school on a Saturday, uh, you played your Friday match and it went late, and then you had to get up the next morning, hit on the hit on the courts a little bit after breakfast, uh, get a quick bite to eat, come back and play in the afternoon. It could be a real long weekend. Or if you had a hurt player, an injured player, you didn't want to take a risk of hurting that player anymore. Uh, oftentimes the doubles got sacrificed, and or if you had a plane to catch on a Saturday, get to, to get back home, uh, the match was decided, the, you would leave. And so people started stopping the matches, and doubles then became a little bit of a threatened species. And being a traditionalist, I fought the change like crazy, but the proposal was to put doubles first and make it a eight-game pro set, uh, ensuring that the doubles would be played. And since it was essentially a set for each match, the, they would count all three matches combined as one match, and the winner of two of the three sets, the majority of that would get a point for winning the doubles. And I did fight that like crazy, but it turned out to be a tremendous thing. It saved doubles. It made doubles important. And and that one point in an otherwise equal match is very, very difficult uh, and important, uh, difficult to win and important momentum-wise. Another reason I liked that change or came to like the change was if you're playing in a foreign on a foreign court, one you're not used to, it puts all your a lot of courts like ours at Stanford are set out so you have three three championship courts, then you have three courts in the back rather than six in a row. That's fairly common. And uh you you now start with all your players playing together to start the match. They're close together where you can get a little interaction and a little feeling and a little excitement. And everybody gets a chance to get used to the courts and the environment in a match competition 
and the downside is you only lose one point. Whereas in singles, you might get down a set in five or six matches really quickly while you're adapting to the conditions and be out of the match, in essence. So I thought that was a, a good move, too. So I really that, that format change, I think, has been very, very good. Another format change was one that we actually proposed in 2005. It wasn't accepted at that time because there are two different governing committees, the Women's Tennis Committee, the Men's Entry Tennis Committee. But we bid on the 2006 five championship with the understanding that that it be a combined tournament for men and women at one site. And uh, that the men's committee didn't know what to do with that, so they pushed it back for a year, talked about it with the women's committee, and then we actually enacted that in 2006 when we hosted the first championship with that format. And it turned out, I think, to be a tremendous success. There are some, some, some sacrifices because... Uh, when you have the round of 16 for the team, you only can play men on one day and women in the next, so there's an extra day of sitting around there. But 80% 80 of the schools are out for the summer by the time the inspires roll run anyway, so most of them aren't missing school, and it gives them a day to practice in between matches. And it's a lot of players in one site, but it just created a tremendous synergy and energy for the tournament. And uh, I'm just a... I don't know how long it's going to last because there's a lot of proposals to change back, but I, I loved having both team, uh, both the men and women in the same site and uh, having men's matches, women's matches, and so on. Um, the other thing I would say the big change is the increasingly number the increasingly uh, number of programs that are being dropped, especially in men's tennis, but women's tennis too. So in a nutshell, those are three changes. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, they've all been very significant in their own right. And then, you know, when you combine them, um, you know, they have a huge impact. And now we're seeing for this fall season um, in Division One that play has gone to no-ad scoring on both the men's and the women's side. Last year, during the beginning of the dual season, for like, I think it was six weeks, starting in January of 2014, the men only experimented with no ad scoring, but but starting with this fall competition season, men and women both are using the no ad scoring. Have you gotten any feedback on that? Well, I I, I was on the committee that uh, asked to to be an ex officio on the committee that debated this for almost a year. Uh, it's it's not a new thing for men's tennis in the. 70s, we went no ad and and did it uh, for probably about almost 15 years in men's tennis exclusively. And and I remember some phenomenal matches with this. I don't know that it shortens the matches significantly. It may five or ten minutes. Uh, It may not. Uh, My guess is it does shorten it, but you'd really have to look at the record books and have times when matches stopped and started to see whether an average overall resulted in shortening the matches, but I thought it really made our players better because the players didn't like it, number one, but as a coach, I liked it because I thought it made our players better. You couldn't play loose points. The first point's important. The 30-all point's important. Of course, the deuce point is critical. Uh, it, it You couldn't give away points, and it created more pressure situation for the players, which I think made them better. Uh, I'll never forget uh, the interplay finals with in 1978 with John McEnroe playing John Sadry of North Carolina State. The final score was seven six seven six five seven seven six. I think there's one service break in the whole match, and uh, and I think John John McEnroe won 143 point four points, and John Sadry won 143. It was probably one of the greatest matches I've ever seen, and uh, the atmosphere was electric. You know, three all point in a packed house in Athens, Georgia. The umpire in the chair holds up a red flag, and everybody looks at that court. Uh, where the red flag is and and to see what happens. Uh, I loved it. And uh, then it went back to regular scoring. And and, uh, I think largely because the USTA, and and I may be wrong in this, but I think the USTA in cahoots with uh, some television uh, broadcasters uh, started this uh, college match day or something like that where 14 or 16 matches were going to be broadcast. And I believe what happened was that, uh, on TV, uh, and I believe what happened was the TV people said, yes, we can do that, and we will do that, but we require the match be completed in a two-and-a-half-hour time frame. And I think that might have been one of the things that got 
people talking about no ad again, and there were a lot of other proposals that came up in this on this committee of men's and women's coaches. Uh, uh, the women, the men, in the end, and, and a lot of compromises made. Uh, I think there was a consensus among most coaches. There was a consensus that the matches lasted too long. Uh, that if we're going to attract TV, which I think is a fallacy because I don't think we're going to attract TV, uh, and if we want to put more quote butts quote in the seats, we had to shorten the matches to make them more relevant. Uh, uh, and those were the prime movers on trying to shorten matches. And no ad scoring seemed to be one vehicle by which that might be done. A million proposals came out of this thing. Uh, among them, one that's been in the in the wings for a long time, and that would be uh, playing doubles and singles simultaneously. You have one or two doubles matches and three or four singles matches, and and you play them all at once, and uh, uh, you get the match done in a couple of hours, two and a half hours. But uh, there there were a lot of things going on in the conversations, and what came out of it was a compromise to be tried. And it went to the NCAA committee. There was a backlash started amongst mostly the women's coaches who hadn't had much experience with, with no edge scoring. And uh, and the NCAA committee thought the NCAA coaches were so divided on it that they could not endorse it to try at the NCAA championships this year. So it was decided instead to do it just through the fall. Uh, that's a long answer, but please know that this whole thing came about as a compromise. Uh, personally, myself, I don't see any reason to monkey the scoring business, uh, scoring system, and I think to shorten matches is the wrong reason. I don't think it'll make any difference any any more television opportunities, especially with streaming coming to the front. I don't think it'll make any difference in terms of how many people come to a match. Uh, it's certainly not significant if the match is shortened. I remember uh, the best match I was ever a part of was a match that started at noontime outdoors in 1976. Of course, that was the tennis boom days. But uh, we played outside. We played number six, five, four, and three singles, followed by two and three doubles. Took about a half-hour break, moved inside to our basketball pavilion, and played in order one match at a time on a carpet. Number two singles, number one singles, followed by number one doubles. Uh, we had over 7,000 people at this particular match. We did this for 10 years or so. Uh, 7,000 people watching Stanford play UCLA who were still there at quarter to one in the, mo- in the morning uh, when we get into the third set, and it's four all, and there have been no service breaks for the whole match, four all in points and four all in games in the third set. And UCLA uh, breaks us on a three all point. We came back and break them on a three all point. Now it's five all. They break us on a three all point. Quarter one in the morning, five six, third set for the whole match. Uh, another three all point, and all four players ended net. UCLA wins a point and wins a match five four. An incredible, incredible match, and no one left. Uh, you don't see people walk into Wimbledon and leave. Uh, they go and they they go and watch tennis. Uh, I, I, I think we're a little bit hyper about, or we might be misjudging a little bit the effect that shortening matches might have on, on the state of college tennis. Well, I agree with you 100% on that, and uh, it's it's kind of been a, a frustrating situation to to experience, given that my son is getting ready to enter. Hopefully, <laughs> getting ready to enter the college tennis arena. And you know he just wants to play tennis how he's always played tennis, so it's it's a bit frustrating. But well, the USGA I think is a little bit uh, they're not together on this quite either. I don't believe either what kind of scoring system you use and what tournaments and so on. So uh, you know I think we better get our act together one way or the other, and 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 we can't experiment forever on this thing. Uh, I I. I I, I, there, are, there are pros and cons both ways, but I, I personally, I, I, some, a lot of people say that if you play no out in college and then you go out in the summer and play pro tournaments, which tennis, the nature of tennis allows you to do, to play as an amateur and even get a, a pro ranking. Uh, it used to be what before the best of 18 or best of 14 rule went into effect, which protects the top players in the world because they can throw out their bad losses. They don't get averaged in. makes it a lot tougher for a young guy to break in. It used to be that you could play college tennis in the school year and then play three months of pro tennis in the summer. And you could, in that short amount of time, three months become ranked in the top 100. And I think specifically of uh, Jeff Tarango, who uh, was at Stanford. And 
uh, went out and play, he played no ad and then went out in the summer and got to be top 100. Those points stayed with him for a year. He came back to school, had no problem transitioning, obviously, from no ad to regular scoring, came back to school in fall and went right to Wimbledon when he, the next year. Uh, the same happened with Danny Goldie twice. Uh, uh, he went out and uh, got ranked in the top 100 in the summer after using no ad scoring during the year, uh, went out and used conventional scoring during the, the summertime. In fact, uh, no ad school, uh, scoring might have helped him because they got better at pressure points and came back to school being in the top 100, knowing the next year he'd go out and be able to play straight in the main draw of Wimbledon. So so I, I, I don't think it hurts player development. Interesting. Well, one of the, the arguments that keeps coming up is that we have to make tennis more relevant. We have to make college tennis more relevant. And um, I was sharing with you before we went on the air, I, I, I watched over the weekend – uh, Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel on HBO, and they had a segment on a new sport. And I'm saying the word sport in quotation marks, but it falls under the athletic department at an NAIA school in Illinois, and the sport is video gaming. And these, quote, athletes are being paid $19,000 each in scholarship money to compete in video gaming. They wear their university's athletic logo on their gear. They, they've been given jerseys and warm-ups and all the same type of um, gear that, that other athletes are given. And the national championships for this of sport sold out the Staples Center in LA. So video gaming as a sport is more relevant than tennis. <laughs> and I watched this this segment on on HBO and all I kept thinking is, oh my gosh, what can we learn from these people? They have created a a desirable product that sells out the Staples Center, for goodness sake, to watch somebody else play a video game. And these, quote, athletes are being paid to practice. People want to watch them practice playing video games, and they get paid for that. It's it's the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. So given what's <laughs> happening out there, what can we learn as as a tennis community from something like the video gaming industry, from something like the X Games that has created this incredible buzz around its sport, what do we need to do as, as a tennis community to do that for our sport? Well, first of all, several things. Uh, by the way, I don't have HBO, but I hear that Brian Gumbel show, and I hear uh, Mary Carroll is on it a lot too, is, is an incredible show. Uh, interesting topic. I did not hear of this. I, I think if they were playing Wii, at least there's some kind of exercise. <laughs> Wii tennis, at least there'd be some exercise involved. But, uh, yeah, I, I think sport, your definition of sport is really the key. If you're talking about athletics, that's something different. Um, I think that sports, college sports is an example. It is becoming entertainment, rather uh, entertainment, of, of course, and you see that with the big TV contracts are going to football and basketball, as an example, and you see the effects in that, and how then the detriment at that amount of money they're spending on those sports is going to have on tennis. Uh, uh, I know for some time cheerleading has been a sport. A lot of schools have given cheerleading, uh, but that's a physical exercise. Uh, my daughter was on the volleyball team at Harvard and also danced on the dance team at Harvard. They have a national championship. I don't I don't think they gave scholarships. Well, they don't give scholarships at Harvard for athletics, but there is a national dance championship, uh, and that's and that's that's athletic. Uh, but in words, and, and but I think when you combine athletics. You're talking about athletics on one side involves physical activity. Sport could be anything. Uh, croquet, uh, riflery doesn't involve as an NCAA sport that doesn't involve physical exercise per se. I don't think. Uh, so there's a little bit of precedence there, but uh, entertainment really is what we're talking about, and and I think we got to be have to be careful that we don't confuse entertainment with athletics. Uh, if you're looking what 
part of the question is, what can tennis do if this is so relevant? Is it, is it relevant? Obviously, it is from what you described. Uh, but if we're going, if we're worried about shortening match, length of matches, if we're worrying about costs in tennis, if we want to do something in a half hour, reduce costs by reducing scholarships and therefore opportunities, by reducing coaching costs, coaches by and and uh, therefore reducing coaching opportunities. Uh, I think in that in that case, tennis would consider something like world team tennis where men and women play on the same team. You have a, maybe a couple of singles matches going at once, a men's singles, a women's singles, or two of each, a uh, couple of men's doubles, a couple of women's doubles, simultaneously on two courts, and a mixed doubles or two mixed doubles. Uh, the match is over an hour and a half. You have great variety. Uh, of course, uh, that's going to cost a lot of jobs, but that's also going to not cost as much money. Uh, you wouldn't have as many people on a team. Uh, and you still have your fall season, have your individual events and your two out of three set matches. So if you're talking entertainment and you're talking really being serious about cutting down how much time a match takes and putting seats in the, uh, people in the seats, <laughs> I would maybe almost uh, sacrilegiously propose world team tennis as an alternative. You can yell as much as you want. You can get your fans involved. You don't have to look up at a student section where you have your fraternities and sororities saying, shh, be quiet, please. Uh, so when we're talking about entertainment, uh, then I think then something like this becomes <laughs> ironically a possibility, no matter how far out there it might sound. Yeah. I'm gasping as I'm sitting at my computer to think of college tennis uh, resorting to that. But well, you know, we did that. We in the uh, '80s when we were playing indoors, uh, we had a uh, world team tennis franchise in Northern California, Billie Jean's uh, Golden Gators, uh, and we actually played them indoors. People loved it. And we played USC uh, in a world team tennis match indoors. We played every no, we did not. I'm sorry. We played Cal Berkeley in a world team tennis match indoors uh, for four or five years, and fans loved it. So, uh, so I think there is a fan appeal there, and and uh, uh, it's a way to cut costs, a way to cut your match time down, and a way to pri- provide a variety of matches, which is uh, simultaneously really, which is. Uh, I'm just saying. Right. No, I, and what's interesting is because I, as you're talking, I'm I'm trying to compare what you're saying to what's going on on the junior tennis front, and really, it's it's a matter of looking at college tennis as a form of entertainment versus as a form of development and true competition for the athletes that are participating. And I think we see the same thing on the junior side when you're talking about growing the game of tennis and increasing the number of kids that start playing the sport versus developing champions. And those are two very different goals and require two very different sets of um, steps. Well, I think Lisa, I think we say developing champions, you have to define what you mean by champions. Are you talking about a champion of the world? Are you talking about uh, a Grand Slam champion? Are you talking about the champion of the USTA league team? Are you cha- talking about, uh, uh, you know, there can be a champion at every level, any level of competition. It defines, depends how you define competition. And uh, if our goal in college tennis is to develop a world champion, uh, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, if our goal in tennis is to make someone a better tennis player in college tennis or in USTA tennis, yes, that can be done and should be done. And the college program can help a player along the way in conjunction with their own player's own coach or own background and so on. Right, but I guess my point is if we're focusing on the entertainment side of tennis and, and those who speak of tennis as needing to stay relevant, I think tend to think in the entertainment um, kind of mindset, you know, will that be to the detriment of the development of the individual athletes? And, you know, is there a way to reconcile those two? Well, very frankly, I I, I was on, a com- and on this committee. Uh, I was, uh, number one, I, I finally, comp- I was non-voting, but I compromised my views to come out with something that I thought would work uh, as a compromise, which... So, therefore, I supported the no-ad scoring. But, very frankly, I don't think we mess around with it all. Uh, we have a good product that develops players or should develop players. Uh, it's giving them a good opportunity. Uh, 
I don't see. I, I frankly don't see a need for changing the scoring. This was a. I did like no ad scoring when he used it. I don't think it's bad. I thought it was a good compromise in terms of these different things we've been talking about. But why are we shortening the matches in the first place? Uh, I mean, two out of three said match is pretty good. Why are we calling the match? Why are we saying, well, let's stop it when it's clinched? Uh, and you leave three guy, two guys in the court who haven't worked like crazy for two hours to win a match. And there were five on the third set, but the whole match decided, see, you stop their play. Is that developing players? Of course not. And all these ideas came out of this thing, which, you know, we were all over the map on it. And and uh, I just hate to see this kind of thing happen. I think we have a good product. Uh, yes, tennis is not putting a lot of butts in the seat right now. Uh, other than the Grand Slam tournaments, uh, tennis is down in most things it, as far as spectator-wise go. Um uh, but I just uh, I, I I I agree with you. I don't think we want to sacrifice the development of a player and and we have to be very careful we don't do that. USTA is doing a lot of work with uh uh league tennis and I think that our team tennis. I think not world team tennis. I'm talking about playing on junior teams. And I think that's nice that camaraderie. It kind of it, that that carries over to college tennis. It prepares the kids a little bit for the feeding of playing on a team. So many of these kids don't go to high school. And uh, they don't, and even if they do, they don't play in their high school team. That uh, the USJ is bridging that gap a little bit with some of their team programs, whether it be section versus section or whatever. And I think uh, I have a granddaughter who's represented NorCal in several of these sectional things, intersectional matches. She loves it as well as, as a Kaufman to her regular tournaments. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I think that is great. I, I like that. USTA is starting to think out of the box a little bit with that, and and I think it is definitely to the benefit of our kids. Anything that that can help them and give them more opportunities is always a good thing. So let me just ask you, though, in terms of this whole idea of keeping tennis relevant, one of the things I've noticed recently, and, and maybe I'm just hypersensitive to it right now, but I swear there are more TV commercials now that incorporate tennis somehow in their, and and I'm not talking sports-related or tennis-related. I'm talking like insurance companies and restaurants, and you see people on the tennis court or or you see them in tennis gear. And so obviously tennis is something that resonates with people, at least the advertising world sees it that way. Are we missing something here that, I mean, is tennis really not relevant, or are we being hypercritical of our sport? I, it's, it's really confusing to me. Well, if you look at participation numbers, uh, the tennis industry does the surveys every year, and, and I just got the last issue. And, and uh, tennis is, is still growing. Uh, it slowed down a little bit, but it was one of the very few participant traditional sports that was growing in participation, uh, maybe the leading participant sport in terms of growth over the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, every, everything kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. The tennis boom in the 70s was a tremendous thing. Uh, then it slowed down. Uh, and, yes, you have very marketable people in Venus and Serena and Roger and Raphael, uh, Rafa in uh, terms of the Twins, uh, you have very marketable people, and and Sharapova, um, these people can sell a lot of product, and and they appeal to a certain level of clientele that the advertising world is after in certain products. Uh, I think in general the use of athletes to promote products has increased, and and as their visibility on TV has increased, and I don't know that it's limited just to tennis. Well, I'm talking about like just showing Joe Blow. With a tennis racket, you know, oh, as, yes. part a, as part of a, an insurance company ad. I mean, it's it's interesting. Well, and, and that, but that makes sense because insurance, as an example, is a great example. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's based on health. It's based on activity. Uh, our comp- our country is becoming much more sedentary. Playing video games, as you say, uh, there's a value to. <laughs> There's a value to an insurance company to get people to be more active, and therefore, for portray uh, to portray active people and and athletes. And right. you can't. I mean, how many people at 40 can play football or <laughs> right. basketball? I mean, tennis is is a great sport to show that in that sense. Right. And for certain products. 
Right. And I guess I guess my point is that, you know, tennis is very visible. Um, and so I, I just question that whole relevance argument that those that are in power to make the rules around college tennis keep throwing out, that we've got to keep tennis relevant, we've got to keep tennis relevant. And, and I understand that it's a non-revenue sport at the collegiate level. I get that. But um, I, I, I'm not sure monkeying with format is the answer. And I would agree 100%. Yeah, so that's good. I like having you on my same side, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's switch gears a little bit and kind of flash back to your coaching years at Stanford. I, a friend of mine messaged me on Facebook and said, please ask him about his ability to remember people's names and faces. It's phenomenal. (laughs) I didn't see him for 20 years. I saw him, and he called me by name. I don't get how he does that. So can you share your secret? (laughs) (laughs) Well, believe me, when my wife is around, she's easy because I'll I'll lean over and say, who is that? (laughs) uh, Actually, the master at this, uh, above all and everyone else, is Dennis Vandermeer. Dennis will have... uh, uh, when he was teaching and coaching a lot, he would have a, a clinic with 30 people there, and in five minutes he'd know everyone's first name. And it's an art, believe me, and I don't profess to be anywhere near as good as he is. But you remember people for dis- different reasons, and, and uh, uh, obviously I don't remember all faces and names, but uh, that's one thing about being in the tennis world. You meet so many people, and, and I, I really enjoyed what I do here at Stanford because it's allowed me to run youth camps, adult camps, national training camps, uh, Junior Davis Cup camps, Junior Whiteman Cup camps. So I have a youth, uh, adult camps, uh, uh, adult tournaments, pro-ams. Uh, it just, I've met so many great people through tennis. I wish I could remember them all. Uh, some I do, some I don't. I don't want to break, break the bubble. But well, Dennis Vander was a very, very best at this of anyone I've ever seen. And can you talk a little bit about the specifics of your interaction with your players um, on the court, what types of drills did you do with them? What types of off-court work did you do with them? What made the Stanford legacy the great legacy that it is? Well, in the first place, when I started coaching uh, at Stanford, I, ha- I, I coached three teams. I had a freshman team because freshmen could not play on the varsity their first year in, in, by NCAA rule. I had a uh, junior varsity team. And I had a varsity team. So I had about 30 or 35 players I was coaching. So really all I was doing was was uh, 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 maintaining practice drills. And I wasn't doing any one-on-one work. And, and then gradually our uh, freshmen in 1972, I believe, became eligible, or 71 after a couple of years, became eligible to play their first year uh, when Title IX came in in the mid-70s. Uh, the women then got equal opportunity, so they they took uh, half the courts the men were using, uh, and so we stopped our junior varsity program. Fortunately, that's been made up by by club tennis, uh, tennis on campus, which is just a tremendous, tremendous thing. We had a big, a big club tournament here this weekend with uh, probably 30 schools. It was incredible. Uh, very talented kids who might not have the time, nor the inclination, nor quite the ability to be in a varsity team, but it was a uh, very high-level tennis. Uh, but and also in those days when I started coaching, I was a trainer. I had to learn to tape ankles. Uh, Roscoe Tanner would sprain his ankle. I was the guy who taped him. Uh, we didn't have a strength coach or a conditioning coach when people started doing. Uh, started when became a fad, if you wish, and started out with more strength training. Uh, I had to learn how to do that. So I'd take my guys to the weight room and put them through a series of things myself. Uh, for conditioning besides tennis. I do the off-court running and off-court agility work. Uh, now you have specialized, specialists in all those areas, which is really good as far as the players are concerned. Uh, I think the biggest single thing for college tennis, which I hope never changes, is the fact that a coach may may coach a player during a match. And when a kid comes to college, so many times they're just just growing into their own bodies. They're 16, 17, 18 years old, uh, finally catching up to their growth, ability, uh, agility-wise, strength-wise, and all of a sudden they find they can do a lot of things they couldn't do before. Uh, my mantra was to, rather than wait for your opponent 
to miss a shot was to force the action to have your opponent react to you rather than you react to your opponent. Therefore, I really preached a serve and volley game. I really preached uh, putting pressure on a second serve return and coming in behind it, uh, getting in as soon as you could off the ground if the opponent stayed back, and making your opponent react to you. That was really my mantra and how I made my living. Uh, but when you come when you come in as a junior player, you haven't been doing that. You've been taught first of all to keep the ball in play and win the points by not missing, and you don't have the confidence when coach says to serve and volley this next match. To, uh, do at least first serve half on half your first serve serve and volley. So, a lot of our practice time was spent on drills uh, and situations that would make someone more comfortable doing this. And then during the match, I could ask a player. I'm not going to ask a player to do something that I don't think he can do. I would tell him, I said, okay, let's kick this up the back end, get him behind it, serve a body forehand and it's in the ad court and come in behind it. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it wouldn't, but then it wasn't the kid's fault. Uh, I was, I wouldn't ask him to do something I didn't have a fair amount of confidence he could execute or that might work. It took the onus off the kid and put it on me. So I was the bad guy. It wasn't the kid messing up. And and that that made me very effective in getting this principle across because I could I could do this. I think I only had one player who didn't win the NCAA serving and volleying. That was Bobby Bryan, and uh, uh, all the other players did. And and uh, so so coaching was a big part of that uh, on court coaching. You could take something you've been working on in practice, and you can insist the kid do it by saying, "Okay, uh, here's how I want you to serve this point or the second service where." what I want, or in doubles, let's go eye formation, let's move uh, this way to cover the backhand volley or to be able to give yourself a better chance at a forehand volley or whatever. Uh, and the beauty of all this was after a year and a half or two years, I'd start to tell a kid what to do, and he'd already be doing it. It was already a part of his game, and that was the beauty of coaching, the, uh, being able to coach during the match. I spent a lot of time on situations. We didn't have an assistant coach uh for most of my coaching career, half of it. And so rather than to be tied down with one player, I had to run practice for 12 or at first 35 players and 12 players. So we worked a lot in situations, uh, 15 minutes to work on attacking in a second serve. 15 minutes we'd work on serve and volley off the first serve, then maybe off the second serve. Then we'd play backcourt points for 15 minutes and so on. And so we worked a lot in situations in practice, especially situations I didn't feel they were comfortable with. Interesting. Well, since you bought, brought up Bob Bryan, I'm going to bring up a um, conversation that I was lucky enough to participate in with Mike Bryan and Wayne and Kathy, his parents, and my son. Um, we were all at the table together. And your name. You came had a up. great table. We had a great table, and your name came up numerous times. So, can you share with us a little bit about? how your relationship with your players continues once they graduate and move on in their life and and what your involvement is with them once they're done with their college tennis career. Well, first of all, they're friends, and first and foremost. And, and you know, it, it's a great age to be coaching. Uh, you know, 18, 19 years old, you know everything, but you know nothing. And you're kind of the absentee parent. The parents are really entrusting you with a very valued asset, their most valued asset. And you have a tremendous responsibility not to let the parent down. Uh, This is just a great age to be around young people. And you can have a very positive influence, by example, uh, on their lives. And... You know, you have to you have to enjoy people, and you have to find you can't you can't you have to find the button that works with a certain kid. Uh, any parent will tell you, "Well, I have three kids; they're all different." Well, how can it be different? They grew up in the same environment, they grew up with the same parents, the same genes, but they're different. Their abilities are different. Their likes are different. Uh, it just the first thing is to realize that, and as a coach or teacher or parent. You have to realize what button to push to get the most out of each person, and it's different with everyone you have. And it takes a while sometimes to do that. Uh, When you have people who have been brought up with the values that Kathy and Wayne taught the the twins, uh, you have a head start because these are just tremendous people. And and I don't know uh, of all my players over the years, I, I am still in regular contact with almost all of them. 
and uh, and, uh, and about a variety of issues. Sometimes it's a, a question regarding a job. Sometimes it's, well, what do you think about this coach? Or, hey, guess what, coach? I'm going to do this now, or or whatever it might be. And this is, I, I, I really, really value this. It's, it's made my life so rich, and I'm a better person because of it. Well, and I think as a parent, you know, who's now going through the recruiting process with with my son, that's something I look for in the coaches that he's talking to. You know, is is that coach going to be able to fulfill that role for him over his four years of college and, and really step in and, and be a positive influence over him? And obviously, you've done that for so many players over the years. And And I'm telling you, every time your name comes up, it's an a, a you know a gush of positive things and and the impact that you've had over these players is just incredible and and I know you're so proud of that and yeah you know, well that's, that's kind that. of you say that I, I I would like to think it's the case I'm sure it's not always the case but I I I, I think uh, I, I think that's what makes my job so rewarding more than anything else and and to take it one step further and and this is a bad sense in which to use this with but. You know, as coaches, we owe it to ourselves to stay in touch with our players. If we're looking to raise a thousand dollars to do something, you know, who better to ask than the players who played for you or played college tennis? And uh, and I don't ask them for very much along the way, but uh, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm certainly they're going to be the first guys to go to I go to if I have a project I'm doing uh, without putting undue pressure on them, but to let them know we're doing something and ask if they might like to participate in it. So it behooves every coach out there to stay in close contact with their players. I think I'm going to say one more thing. I know we're running out of time, Lisa, but there are there are a tremendous amount of incredibly talented coaches coaching men's and women's college tennis today uh i must say i enjoyed the com- competition and camaraderie i had with my coaches and my profession as much as i did with, with my players uh as a parent you should not have very many concerns in that regard i i had a, a daughter who played tennis at princeton i had a uh, uh, daughter who was uh, captain of swim team and All-American at USC. I had a son captain of swim team and All-American at Stanford. Uh, I had a daughter who was captain of the, of the Harvard volleyball team, the only time they won uh, Eastern Air Collegiates. I have kids that have played all these sports, and all of them have been with coaches who really cared about the kids. And I think that's I think that you're pretty safe in, in college tennis looking at that. Uh, that's uh, I have a, I'm in a profession with great people. Well, I agree. I mean, so far, everyone that I've met has been <laughs> incredible, and I, I I don't think I've come across anyone that I would say, oh, I don't want my kid playing for him. <laughs> but, yeah, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone like that, I, I tell you. Right. right. Well, thank you so much, Dick, for being with us today. I, I knew you would provide some wonderful insights, and you have, and, and I appreciate it so much. And uh, I look forward to continuing our conversations in the future. Well, Lisa, good luck. Keep it up, and I love the I love this uh, uh, what you do. And and Chuck, I haven't heard Chuck Creasy talk yet. <laughs> I love the guy, and it was re- really fun competing against him. And Jason Haynes, of course, uh, just uh, had the opportunity to work with Jason for a number of years. A great person, and and JP Weber is doing a great job as well. And and you guys are the ones that are keeping tennis at the forefront. And these are the kinds of programs that uh, uh, are are really going to keep tennis there. And I think are a tremendous help to to the public and and parents in general and kids. Yeah, I hope All so. my best, Lisa. Keep it up. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Sure, Lenny. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To my listeners, thanks so much for tuning in today. Don't forget, starting next week, the show is moving to Tuesdays. The time is yet to be determined, but as of now, it's looking like 11 a.m. Eastern time will be our broadcast time. Check our Facebook and Twitter feeds for updates later this week once I have that firmed up. And don't forget to send me your suggestions and ideas for future guests and future topics. I am always open to hearing from you and value your input so much. So you can always reach me at lisa at parentingaces.com. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you next week on Parenting Aces.